Uh, good morning. So, actually, let me teach a little bit so that we can complete that part and we also can test this new setup that everything is working fine. So, um, if you remember, we had this uh, theorem. So, let me change to. Okay, so we had this theorem last time. So we learned what is the what are the properties of scalar multiplication, meaning multiplying a number by a matrix. And then there are very simple facts that are left that I want to address them here. Uh, so one theorem is that, of course, if you have a number R multiplied by a matrix and it is equal to a matrix B, if you want to find A, or in other words, if you want to make A alone on the left-hand side, if R is not zero, you can actually do very natural by dividing everything by R, and then write one over R B on the other side. Okay, I have to also learn how to switch fast between these two. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so the question is this: I have a number r which I know it is not zero and this r is multiplied by a and it is equal to b from now on I want to use it uh, easily so that you can just divide everything by r and write 1 over b 1 over r times b and it makes sense yes because this is a number and this is multiplied by b but why this is true you say that because r is not zero 1 over r exists, yes? Because 1 over r exists as far as this number in the denominator is not 0. Okay, and then it means that now you are telling me that r times a is equal to b so that I can conclude that 1 over r times r a is also equal to 1 over r times b. But do you remember we had a property that if we have r times s times a in that theorem I can write it as r s times a and we discussed that this depends to the associativity of multiplication of real numbers but we cannot call it associativity so if you remember we had this before using that property giving the role of r to 1 over r and giving the role of s to r I can say that okay instead of this guy I can write 1 over r times r and then multiplied by a is equal to 1 over r b but everyone knows that this uh, 1 over r times r this is just a normal multiplication it becomes 1 times a is 1 over r b but uh, we also know that 1 times any matrix is the matrix itself yes so from now on, you really don't need to bother about uh, this. So if you have this, you can immediately conclude that A itself is this one. And there is also another rule that if you watch here, uh, this is similar uh, to the zero product rule. So this tells you that if you have a number R multiplied by a matrix, but the answer is the zero matrix. This can happen only if at least one of these are zero. Either R is the number zero or A is the matrix zero. Yes. So that is also something we need to know. But why is that true? If I have R times A is equal to the zero matrix, I can conclude that R is the zero number or A is the zero matrix. Usually if you want to prove a mathematical statement so that in its conclusion you have this or, you would say, you can start like this. You can say that if R is zero, we are done. I hope that this doesn't seem very strange. Okay, so I want to prove that either this is true or that is true. Okay, and when you say or in mathematics, it is always uh, considering both. It's inclusive or, yes? So either this one is true or that one is true, or of course both of them are true. So if you agree R is zero, we are done. 
in if you don't agree that r is zero i have to show to you that you have to agree that a is zero is the logic clear you want to show that either this one happens or that one if you agree that this has happened <laughs> fight is over so you are done if you don't agree with this one then i show you you have to admit that the second one happens Okay, so this means that either this one happens or that one happens. Okay, I want you to understand the logic. Okay, if R is equal to zero, we are done. If not, and if, if not, let me write what is the meaning of if not means R is not zero, then what can I write? I, can, I have R, A is equal to zero, then I can conclude from that theorem that R A is 1 over R 0. Yes? If you say R is 0, we are done. If you say R is not 0, I can use this theorem and then divide everything by R. But now everyone knows that any number multiplied by the 0 matrix is the 0 matrix. That's it. So if you agree that R is zero, we are done. If you disagree with this one, then you have to agree that A is capital zero because of this previous theorem. Okay. And then of course, uh, I have given you a very, very simple exercise here. Probably we don't even need to bother about this. If you want to solve a system of matrix equations, you can usually just normally do it, yes? Because everything we learned here is very natural. So whatever you were able to do with normal numbers, you can also do with matrices, yes? Uh, so if you want, we can, of course, uh, solve this quickly. Uh, I will switch the view after I'll be able to write this down. So this is 2x plus 3y is equal to one two three zero and the other one is uh, 3x plus 4y is equal to another two by two matrix one two one one and then we are supposed to find the capital x and y probably you understand that they are two by two matrices now so what do i do here if I want to find capital X and capital Y, I can pretend that X and Y are just numbers, yes? So, yeah. so these are numbers, they're block of numbers, but the rules that we have learned so far for addition and scalar multiplication is completely according to what we know from numbers. So uh, what do you think? It's a good idea to concentrate to get rid of one of these variables. So what can I do? If you say this one is equal to that one, I can conclude that, for example, uh, minus four times this is also equal to minus four times that. And what I can do here, I can multiply everything by, for example, three. Yes? So then what happens, can you do it in your head? If I multiply it by minus four, it becomes minus 8x. If I multiply this by 3, it becomes positive 9x. And if I add them, positive 9x minus 8x, it becomes just single x. Yes, here it becomes minus 12y, but this becomes positive 12y. When I add them, they are gone. Actually, that was my goal to do this. So what I need to do is to multiply this minus by minus 4, multiply this matrix by 3, and then add them. So let us just do it in two steps. If I multiply this by minus 4, it becomes this. And then plus, if I add the other one by 3, it becomes 3, 6, 3, and 3. Yes? And then if you add them, it becomes minus 1, minus 2, and then uh, you have minus 9 and 3. Yes? So you found the matrix A, X. And that is up to you. You can use the same method to find y, or now that you have x, you can s replace this x, for example, here with that matrix, multiply it by 2, move it to the other side, simplify it, and then divide by 3. Yes? So, are you adding the two matrices? Are the two equations? Yeah. Yeah. 
So I just want, I gave you this example because I want to say that nothing strange is going on. As far as you, the operations involved are addition or subtraction and scalar multiplication, everything goes smoothly as you knew before about numbers, yes? Things become a little bit more interesting when you start t uh, reading about, uh, studying about the matrix multiplication, which you will study from the next session. Okay, so I, did I don't continue this, so you can just do it yourself. It's extremely simple. Uh, okay, so now, uh, and I think that is also very, very simple, yes? If you have a matrix, a square matrix, of course, if you multiply it by R, what happens? You are multiplying every entry by R. And this would be clear that if you start adding up uh, the entries on the main diagonal, it would be R times larger than the other one, yes? But let us just uh, formally prove this one as well. Uh, yes, how can we prove this? We want to show that, uh, we want to show that the trace of r times a is equal to r times trace of a. So it doesn't matter. It is always good to interpret these equalities like this. It doesn't matter if you multiply first and then take the trace, or take the trace first and then multiply. So these operations are commutative. That's the meaning. That's the better way of reading this equation. But why is that true? I start from the left-hand side. So I would say that let A be of order N. Yes? So the left-hand side becomes, according to the definition of the trace, what does it mean? It means the sum of R times A, but the uh, entries on the main diagonal. So it means I, I. And then I run I from 1 to N. N is this order. Yes, but we just learned what is this one? This means that this is equal to i equals to 1 to n r times a, the entry i i becomes equal to entry of this one i i multiplied by r. This is the definition of a scalar multiplication. And then this r is a no constant number. Why? Because it doesn't depend on the counter of the sigma. So I can pull it out. So then it becomes R, sigma, I goes from 1 to N, A, I, I. But if I ask you what is this guy, that is just the definition of the trace of A. So this becomes R times trace of A, and this becomes the right-hand side. As simple as that. And now, can you just imagine what will happen if I have this uh, trace of Ra plus Sb? A and B are square matrices of the same order, and R and S are just numbers. Yes, so that's also good to know. Do you remember? We had this before. What happens if I have the trace of A plus B? We had this before. If they are of the same order and a square, you can write the trace of the first one plus the trace of the second one. Yes, that's also good to interpret it in that way. It doesn't matter if you first add and then take the trace, or take the trace first and then add. So that's the meaning of this. Okay, so this we had before, this we have just now, so I can use these two simultaneously, yes? I have a matrix plus another matrix. I am interested in the trace of the sum, so it becomes the trace of the first one plus the trace of the second one, yes? And now by this rule, I realize that R can be pulled out, and then S can also be pulled out. So this is something important to know, that if you want to tr calculate the trace of such a combination, you can do, uh, you can act like this. Okay. Uh, so this is a term I just want you to learn. Okay, there is nothing deep inside, but this is something very ubiquitous in matrix theory. So assume that you have matrix A, and you have bunch of other matrices from E1 up to EN, okay? But they have to be all of the same sizes. So if this is five by, fi five by seven, for example, A, 
I consider all these matrices 5 by 7. Yes, so assume that you have a bunch of matrices A and some other matrices all of the same size. We say that, this is the terminology I want you to learn, we say that capital A, this matrix A, is a linear combination of the other matrices. If you can find real numbers R1 up to R on Rn such that this happens. Yeah, that's as simple as that, yes? So if you can write a matrix A, as a multiple of as the sum of multiples of a bunch of matrices then you would say that this matrix A is written as a linear combination of these matrices yes so let me just give you an example here and by the way these numbers are called the coefficients of this linear combination for example consider this matrix A this matrix A is a linear combination of the following matrices why is that? Because, for example, if you multiply E1 by 2 and multiply E2 by minus 5 and add them together, it becomes the matrix A. That's a straightforward calculation you can do with yourself. For example, let us do it for the first entry. If I multiply this by 2, it becomes 6. If I multiply this by minus 5, it becomes minus 5. And if I add 6 to minus 5, it becomes 1, and that is exactly 1. And let us check the other one. If I multiply this by 2, 8. If I multiply this by minus 5, positive 5, positive 5 plus 8 is 13. And you can continue this. That's it. So if you see this, this is the terminology I want you to learn. You can say A, matrix A, is a linear combination of E1 and E2. That's it. Okay? Sometimes it is possible to write a matrix as a linear combination of other matrices, sometimes it is not. So let us just do this exercise here. So let me write this here and then I will switch the camera. So write the matrix as a linear combination of the following matrices. Okay, so the matrix that I want to give the rule, so, so let me just write it. It is minus 3, 4, 2, 0. Yes, and then I have a group of matrices which are 0, 1, 1, 0. The other one is what? Minus 1, 1, 1, 0. Yeah, please make sure that I'm not making any mistakes. 0, 0, 1, 0. Yes? If possible, I want to write this matrix as a linear combination of these three matrices. Yes? What does it mean? So if you don't mind, let me give this a name. A, let me give this a name E1, E2, and E3. What I want to write, I want to find three numbers, so let me call them R, S, and T, so that A is R times E1 plus S times E2 plus T times E3. Let us see if it is possible or not. So then... Uh, so you need to remind me if I forget to switch. Yes. Yeah. So here, this is my matrix A, and these are three matrices. I want to write this matrix A as a linear combination of these three. What is the meaning of this? It means that if possible, find three numbers, R, S, and T, so that this combination becomes equal to A. So let us see if it works or not. A is this matrix, minus 3, 4, 2, 0. And then R times E1. E1 is that one I multiplied by R, so I have to multiply every entry by R, 0, R, R, 0. And then plus, I multiply E2 by S, minus S, 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 0. And then I multiply the other one by T, 0, 0, T, 0. Now, if I write it once more, it's minus 3, 4, 2, 0. On the right-hand side, I will have these numbers added, so it's minus S, yes? and R plus S, and then I have again, uh, so am I right? Yes, R plus S, R plus S plus T, and then 0 plus 0 plus 0. So I have to make this equality right. So by comparison, 0 is 0, so that is good. Minus 3 should be minus S, so I realize that S has to be 3. R plus S should be 4. But I already found S to be 3, so this gives me that R has to be 1. 
And then I also have to check the other one, and that is R plus S plus T is 2. Is it working or not? R plus S is 4, so T is minus 2. Yes? And then what you have to provide as the answer is not here finished because you are supposed to write that matrix as a linear combination of them. So what I expect you to write is to write A is equal to R is 1, and then you have S is 3, and then T is minus 2. So I was able in this case to write uh, this matrix as a linear combination of these three matrices. Yes? Any questions here? Uh, okay, so I think now everything here is finished. So next time actually we uh, go to the, the most interesting part of matrix theory and that's matrix multiplication. But we have a little bit of time, yes? Don't we? Okay, so let me see. Uh, okay, if I have this one, I don't know how many of you have solved these exercises. I did you do that? Okay, but these are some of them are good. Let me let me actually solve uh, one of them for you. For example, let us concentrate here on number four. So let me write number four here. Because in matrix theory, it is important to be able to work with sigmas in a nice way. I will write it down and then remind me if I forget to switch the camera. So s we are supposed to calculate sigma of this combination. Yes, 1 over 3k minus 2, and then 3k plus 1, and then k goes from 1 to 100. I am assumed, uh, I'm supposed to find this sum. Yes? Um, was it 3, I think, yes? It was 3, uh, that was my mistake, okay. Uh, so how do you solve this problem? So you know that if, if a sum involves a lot of terms, there's one trick, that as far as I know, and that is making it as a telescopic sum. Yes. How do we do that? Can you write this expression as the sum of two expressions in your head? So let me write it right now, and then if you have some problems, I can describe you a systematic method to do that. So can you tell me if what happens if I just naively write this? Yes? So do you agree that if I subtract them, this becomes very close to this. Why? Because if I subtract them, you take the common denominator, this will be multiplied here, yes? And this will be multiplied here with a negative sign. So it becomes 3k minus 3k plus 2, yes? And then the denominator will be exactly the product of these two. And the interesting thing is that these two are cancelled, but the problem is that I am left with 3 times this. Yes? Is that clear? So I did it a little bit fast, but it is not hard to convince yourself to compensate for that extra three, I put a factor of one third here. So what I'm saying is that be patient, do it, do it at home for yourself, take and calculate this part. It becomes exactly this combination, but instead of having one here that I need, you will have three here. But you want to have one, so this means that I multiply everything by a third. Yes? But now, so this means that f uh, instead of this expression, I can write this expression, but this one third is a constant, I can pull it out from the sigma notation. This, I want you to train your eyes for catching this pattern. Now, can you see what is left here is a telescopic pattern? This I want you to understand. So first of all, a telescopic pattern, do you remember what was it? It was a sigma, then you have some f of some counter minus f of the previous counter or the next counter. I mean, this should be of this type, the difference of the same function with calculated at two consecutive values of the counter. Yes, but do you see that this is happening here? Because if I change k, in this one, if I change k to k plus 1, 
what happens? Then 3k minus 2 goes to 3 times k plus 1 minus 2, which becomes 3k plus 1, which is exactly that one. So even though it seems that the difference between them is 3 units, but by changing k to k plus 1, this term will go to that term. Yes? So this is actually a telescopic sum. So what does it mean? It means that you can write this one third here. Do you remember what was the rule? If I have k going from m to n for calculating this sum, I take the one with the higher value for the counter and replace it with the upper bound. So this becomes f of n. And then I do the same thing for the other one with the lower bound. But here, this one has the higher value of the counter. This one has the lower value for the counter. So what I need to do, I take the lower bound and replace the k with the lower value of the counter with that. So it becomes 1 over 3 times 3 minus 2. And then I will replace this k with that higher value. And that's it. In principle, this is easy to calculate now because there are two terms, 9, 7, and then I have 301. Okay, if, if you want, you can simplify it a little bit, but this is much better than having 98 uh, terms. Okay, so at, at most, you have to calculate two terms. Yes? No, this is the rule. I have already proven that if you have a sigma with that property, we showed that the final answer is if you do like this. Take the, take the, s the lower bound and put it in the one with the lower value for the counter and put the higher one, uh, the upper bound for the one with the higher value of the counter and subtract them. That was the lesson of telescopic sum. Just disappear. Uh, that's the whole point of having it. So one thing that I want to mention is that I want you to catch, to train your eyes to catch that this is indeed a telescopic sum, even though apparently it is not that clear. Because when I write k and then k plus 1, everyone sees that they are consecutive numbers. But you might say that, okay, they are not consecutive numbers, they differ by 3 units. But that's n that doesn't matter. The matter is that k is changed to k plus 1, I will go from one of them to the other one, so that matters. Okay, no questions? Okay, so don't forget about the quiz, and then we continue the lesson uh, with matrix theory next time. Thank you very much.